Hardy's seat as he is running for county commissioner in Berkeley County and uh, not returning to his uh, incumbent uh, seat to the House of Delegates. The candidates are the Democrat Lucia Valentine. Thank you for coming in, Lucia Valentine. Thank you. And S. Christian Anders, or Chris Anders, as I've called him for years as well. Good morning, and thank you for coming in, Chris. Oh, well, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Our uh, candidates will have a minute for an opening statement or so and a minute for closing statement or so as well. And in between, field questions from our panelists, retired Admiral and former Berkeley County Commission President Bill Stubblefield and New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. If uh, you could limit your answers to those questions to one to two minutes or so, that would be appreciated. Uh, certainly, if it is a question that requires a very thorough answer that takes more time, we'll try to accommodate that as well. If your name or one of your policies or uh, thoughts are referenced by your opponent, you have the right to directly respond at the conclusion of that person's uh, thoughts or statements. Just give me a little heads up that you'd like some time to respond. We'll be glad to call on you. Uh, for our uh, opening statement, we'll begin first with Lucia Valentine. Lucia? Thank you. Thank you for having us this morning. My name is Lucia Valentine, and I'm running for House of Delegates in District 97, which includes parts of both Jefferson and Berkeley counties. I grew up here in the Eastern Panhandle, and I'm running for office because of the love that I have for my community. I've spent the last year plus now campaigning and listen, listening to the voters of District 97, and I remain focused on common sense policy solutions that address local issues and the needs and concerns that I've heard directly from voters. These needs include addressing our public education system, our growing infrastructure needs, and helping to strike a balance um, to the growth that we're seeing and making sure that we can ensure that we're uh, preserving and protecting our rural way of life while also creating good paying jobs and economic opportunity for the district. I have experience working at Charleston, in Charleston at the state capitol and helping to pass legislation in a bipartisan way um, that protects the health of West Virginia's people and resources. And so this experience has really taught me the importance of finding common ground and working across the aisle with fellow legislators um, to pass meaningful legislation. And I look forward to applying those skills to this position. So thank you again, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Chris. Oh, good morning. I'm Chris Anders, the Republican nominee for the 97th House of Delegates seat. I'm running to defend your rights and to make government work for the people, not special interests. Currently, myself and my family are under an unceasing attack by special interests in the political class because they're spreading lies about me, because I'm absolutely committed to the truth and to the voters in the Constitution. I cannot be bought, and I will not sell out, and I will not back down. I'm proud to be endorsed by the NRA, the West Virginia Citizens Defense League, the National Association for Gun Rights, and the Eastern Panhandle Business Association. With over 18 years' experience at the state level fighting for your liberty, I'll work to lower taxes, secure our borders against the criminal illegal invasion, as well as return state surplus funds directly back to the taxpayers. <coughs> Together, we can stop the influence of special interests and bring power back to you, the people. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So now we'll begin with questions, and I think we start with John this time, do we not? Um, I, yes. Yeah, okay. Ahead, yes. Yeah. Every other. So, yes, <laughs> you're the other. All right, Chris, let's start with you. You're um, the every. Your, your website, you kind of alluded to it here and in your opening statement, your website leads with the statement that you, you are inviting us, or I am inviting you, to uh, join us in the fight to restore freedom in West Virginia. Could you expound on that? And, what freedoms have been taken and how do you propose to restore them? What does that mean? Okay, first of all, um, there are two parts to freedom. There is your personal liberty and there's your economic liberty, okay? On the personal liberty part, parents still, you know, government still has somewhat of a monopoly on education. Government bureaucrats and politicians are telling parents what, you know, vaccines they must shoot into their children's body, which is insane. Um, they also, under the economic, I mean, our founding fathers rebelled against a 2% tax on tea, but the average West Virginian spends 30% of their gross income on government, more than they spend on clothing, food, and housing combined in a year. So yes, our liberties are being infringed upon. They've been done so by the political class and enterprising politicians who always use as an excuse, we want to take care of you from the cradle to the grave and they take more and more of your freedom away. Follow up, John. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess I'll turn to um, Lucia. Specifically what he mentioned in there was forcing the, the education piece of that, and part of your opening statement dealt with supporting public education. And do you care to comment on that, Lucia? 
Yes, um, part of my platform is supporting education and our teachers and our students. Um, I've spent time shadowing teachers and students in the county to make sure that we can understand how the state can best support their needs. Um, our state constitution guarantees a free education and we absolutely need to be making sure that we're investing in education and making sure that um, all West Virginia children have access to good public schools. Yes. Can I follow up on that? Sure. Because the Cardinal Institute just released a study that only 36% of West Virginia parents are happy with the schooling they're getting. Just throwing more money at the, the system is not going to work. We have to reinvent the system. We have to look at it. I am all in support of locality pay, and I am in support of our teachers, and especially the next generation of West Virginians. But I've worked to pass full and complete school choice in over a dozen states uh, here in the Republic. And um, every time that's happened, teachers' pay has gone up. And the quality of the educational experience has gone up because competition breeds excellent. Government monopolies always create what we have today, and that is a system which is failing our students. Um, I'll quickly respond, and when it comes to school choice, I do value choice. In fact, I was homeschooled for much of my elementary school education and for a year in high school, and so I really do think that parents and families deserve to have the option of right-size education for their families. But that should not come at the cost of taking money away from our public schools um, because, again, we need to be supporting our teachers, our students. I'm hearing from students that mental health services are a big issue in schools. They want to have more mental health counselors in schools. We have discipline issues. We really need to make sure that we're improving the classroom environment and improving our test scores and making sure that we are moving up in the ranks. We've been lowest in education for far too long. Bill. Yeah, this is meant to be a philosophical question more so than a, a very easy yes and no. Uh, in our current political environment, which do you consider to be more important? Partisan victories are working across the aisle. And I'll start first with you, Mr. Anders. I think liberty is more important. Freedom is more important, okay? Because, if, you know, if you look at our Bill of Rights, some of the Bill of Rights the Republican Party goes after and, and destroys, some of the Bill of Rights the Democrats do. That's why I'm kind of in the middle on this, because I believe in the entire Bill of Rights, and I'll fight against either side that attempts to get rid of your God-given freedoms. Did that answer your question, Bill? Yeah, and I want to come back as a follow-up later, but let's ask Ms. Valentine first. Thank you. That's an excellent question and really part of why I'm running for office. Again, I've spent many years advocating at the state capitol, and I have experience working in a bipartisan way to pass meaningful legislation, and I know what it means to work across the aisle and find common ground with legislators. I think that's a chief role of govern governing governing, sorry, and a, and a lost art really in our state government. Things have become way too divisive. You know, West Virginia is used to be being controlled by one party. Um, in my lifetime, we've seen a state largely controlled by Democrats. Now we have a state largely controlled by Republicans. But we're still facing the same issues. And so I really think that this sends the message that we need a new generation of leadership. And um, we need to find ways to work together to solve problems and uh, advance our shared West Virginia values here in West Virginia. Um, I have experience working across the aisle, working in in a bipartisan way. My op opponent has a track record of not even being able to work within his own party. And so West Virginia doesn't need extremism. We don't need extremism on the left, on the right. We need folks who are, are focused on common sense solutions, and that's a huge part of my platform and why I'm running for office. Okay. Let me go back to a follow-up on uh, uh, liberties. Uh, that's a term that's very frequently used. What, whose liberties are we talking about? For example, reproductive rights, Amendment 1, uh, transgender rights. These are liberties as well. Would you would you work to protect these liberties? You you define liberty differently than our founding fathers did. Okay. Um, first of all, when people start talking about reproductive rights, there's no freedom to exercise aggressive violence on an unborn child. Period. End of story. It's not your skull being crushed. It's their skull being crushed. Period. End of story on that. Okay, when it comes to the uh, transgender insanity that we see going on right now, I will be absolutely honest. If someone decides they want to be a German shepherd and they want to call themselves a German shepherd, they can. They can call themselves whatever they want. They just can't infringe upon my liberty to say, hey, hold on a minute, you're not a German shepherd. Okay, their liberty ends when they start infringing on mine. Does that make sense? And how about Amendment 1, the one that's going to be posed up for the uh, uh, physician's uh, assisted suicide? I am absolutely in support of Am Amendment 1, period. Okay. Ms. Valentine, you want to respond to those, the definition of liberty? Um, sure. I'm not uh, entirely sure. Uh 
on a lot of points of my opponent's answer, but when it comes to reproductive rights, you know, I am a woman, and I feel like I'm in more of a position to answer this, but I do fundamentally believe that women uh, deserve the freedom and the privacy to make decisions about their body without government interference. Okay. Uh, Thank you. There was a point that uh, Ms. Valentine made, Chris, about you not being able to get along inside your own party. If a comment about that. Well, it's funny. Um, you know, people bring that up. Because I will be frank, there are way too many undocumented Democrats pretending to be Republicans currently down in Charleston. I will not mince words on that. There are people who, up until uh, West Virginia turned red, they ran as Democrats. And they're still pushing Democratic ideas. I'm a conservative. I am a lover of freedom and liberty. And so party labels, when it comes down to it, if someone's opposing freedom and they're opposing conservative, uh, the conservative agenda... Okay, I'm going to disagree with them. I'm not a team, quote unquote, team player. Okay, I believe in the founding principles. Mr. Gilstrap. But you're being, you're, you're a candidate for one of the great teams. Mm-hmm. So by, by proudly not being a team player, doesn't that sort of marginalize you once you get to the state house? No, because I'm fighting to restore what the Republican Party used to stand for. Okay, the Republican Party used to be the conservative party, and it is in most cases. And that is why I ran as a Republican. But I will tell you, the establishment spent close to six figures trying to defeat me in the primary because they knew that I'm a conservative more than I am a Republican. Okay. Well, I want to. The question I actually want to ask. I want to get back to the the education part, and and it, it kind of. Let's talk about affirmative plans, positive plans on how we're going to fix things. Um, I brought up with the uh, previous um, discussion here, the statistics in West Virginia on education are abysmal. The seventh grade math scores, um, 31% are of, of seventh graders in West Virginia are at grade level in, in math uh, in seventh grade. 39% are at grade level in English arts in, in, in seventh grade across the state. Uh, how do we fix that? You're, you're going to be elected to the state house. How are you going to fix it? What's your plan? Where do you want to go first? Uh, uh, we'll have Lucia go first. Am I saying your name right, Lucia? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, I think, you know, first and foremost, I know there's bipartisan support here in the Eastern Panhandle to pass locality pay. We absolutely must get that done so that we can retain qualified teachers um, in our classrooms. And when it comes to test scores, um, you know, I'm really focused on improving literacy rates. And, you know, we've seen things like the Third Grade Success Act passed so that we have um, aides in, in grades uh, K through th third grade to help improve test scores there. Um, so really interested in um, working with folks on the Education Committee to uh, pass legislation that will improve our test scores. Okay, there's a million things we can do, but first of all, I'm a big believer in full and complete school choice because competition does breed excellence, period. Okay? Giving government a monopoly on anything is a sure you know, recipe for failure. Look at the DMV for once, okay? If we spent much time there, it's an insane mess, okay? Uh, just like giving the government health care. I mean, they, Obamacare has virtually destroyed our health care system, right? Now people want universal health care. It's completely insane. So, yes, I believe in school choice. I also believe in getting rid of Common Core because while they claim they got rid of Common Core, they just ripped off the cover and now calling it College and Career Readiness Standards. We're teaching kids to take a test. If you look at the government interference in the educational system and the United States as a whole, our scores have dropped radically since the Department of Education was created. So we need to restore the power back to the parents. The parents are the only ones who have the moral right to decide what schools their children attend and what schools their tax dollars fund. If we were teaching kids to take the test, wouldn't the test scores be higher? <laughs> you would hope, but the test, have you ever taken a Common Core test? I have. I actually don't know. I absolutely have. It's, it's insane what they're asking people. Okay. Bill? Yes. I, I went from a very general question, philosophical question, to a very, very specific question now. Would you support certificate of need for a local hospice? And I'll start first with you, uh, Chris. Absolutely not. I do not support certificate of need, period, end of story. That's government interference. Ms. Valentine? 
And your question was for hospice? For hospice specifically, yes. Yes. So West Virginia is one of the 35 states with certificate of need. Um, and I've been at the Capitol for several years when this when bills have been introduced to discuss repealing it or keeping it in place. Um, in 2024, this past session, um, there was a bill introduced to repeal uh, certificate of need with exception for hospice, which I think is important um, to keep those exceptions in there for hospice. This bill did not pass. It um, didn't make it uh, out of the House. Um, but I think really to do some level setting too, we really need comprehensive um, health care improvements. You know, our state is la ranked lowest when it comes to health care. Um, we have the worst in the nation, and we really need to make sure that, especially as our community is growing here in the Eastern Panhandle, we have more access to care and not less. Um, but keeping certificate of need for hospice is, is crucial to the su success of those services. Thank you. John. Uh, Lucia, on your website you say that you want to, quote, ensure opportunities for economic development and job creation, unquote. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean to you? How do we do that? Yes, yeah, so this is um, kind of a complicated or layered question, I'll say, um, or issue. Uh, when it comes to economic development, you know, I really think this is a conversation around growth, and I really think it's important to find a balance between preserving and protecting the rural spaces in District 97 while also creating economic opportunities for young people like myself to be able to, be able to live and work in West Virginia. Um, District 97 is very rural, it's very residential, and so we have a lot of generational farms and a lot of new builds going up as well. So trying to find that balance and supporting our economic, our agricultural economy economically so that folks don't feel like their only option is to have to sell their land to make a profit. I think that I've heard from farmers that they need local meat storage uh, uh, packaging facilities, uh, grain storage facilities. So th those are some of the things that we can do to support them economically. And then when it comes to on the development side, this is also a question of water and making sure that we're responsibly re uh, using our land and water resources. And so this is kind of a county issue, but I think the state can support in making sure that we have renewed land and water use studies for Berkeley and Jefferson County so that we can make sure there's adequate water for well drilling when we are building new houses. And this all kind of ties into economic development to make sure that we're attracting the right size development to the area. Um, we're 49th in the nation when it comes to workforce participation rates. I really want to support our workforce and our small businesses. And to do that, I think we need to pass things like having accessible child care so that families remove barriers to, for um, entry into the workforce. We need good public schools so that we have an educated workforce. Um, and we really need to focus on hiring local labor and West Virginians so that, again, folks can stay in West Virginia, stay in the panhandle, and live and work here, and they don't have to go out of state for higher wages. So I'm going to put a little pressure on you. Put that in the form of a plan. Those, yes. Those are goals. So in terms of Im improving workforce participation rate, um, I definitely want to work in, with the legislature to support passing um, child care so that we can support our providers, our employers, and our families so that they have affordable and accessible child care. I know there's conversations about potentially moving um, child care under the Department of Education. Um, tax breaks for businesses who can offer child care services. So th those are some things that I'm working looking at um, when it comes to economic development. Okay, Chris, same question. How do you ensure opportunities for economic development and job creation? Well, the first thing you have to do is get government out of the way. Uh, for 18 years, maybe 20 years, uh, I worked for a scientific equipment manufacturing company. I was a vice president in charge of North American operations. I might know a little bit about business. And I spent the majority of my time dealing with government regulations. Fun. Right. Instead of trying to expand the business and instead of being able to hire more employees, I'd spend a bunch of money on accountants and, and people to deal with the regulators. Uh, in West Virginia, when you go to get a business license, it sometimes takes forever. It can be weeks. It can be months. You know, let's face it. Licenses and permits are you just buying your already existing rights back from the government. It, you know, we're standing in the way of allowing people to uh, prosper. And what's happening then is the state is giving people like Bill Gates hundreds of millions of your tax dollars and the, the government officials are picking winners and losers with your money that is not the moral uh, job of government if we're going to do anything we should be helping our small businesses here because the majority of West Virginians are employed by small businesses but at the same time you know everybody complains about capitalism and they talk about all oh, the free market doesn't work we haven't tried that for a very long time what we had is corporatism and that needs to stop is that a West Virginia problem or a national problem? It's all across the country. Okay, let's talk about West Virginia. Let's talk about the 97th. Okay. How, how do you fix the problem locally? Well, first of all, you start to streamline the process of, of getting business, you know, getting, you know, make licenses easier, cheaper. I'd love to see them free so that people can go into business, you know, allowing them the permits, you know, stop, stop interfering in the business cycle. 
Okay. Let businesses use their resources to expand, not just deal with government agencies. So yes, I'm absolutely, you know, all about the free market and not corporatism or cronyism, which we've had way too much of. Bill, Child Protective Services, a lot needs to be done there. How would you protect, how would you uh, expand our ability to protect the child? Who's first, Bill? Uh, we'll go with uh, Chris again. So okay. You mentioned get government out of everything. Does that include? Well, I don't mean everything. Government has a moral right to protect your pre-existing rights, which are your right to individual life, your right to your individual liberty and your private property okay this falls under individual life yes we do need to work with child protective services there needs to be a huge change there because the police can't even go into the building right now and report something there's a hotline they have to use all right uh, they've created actually impediments to actually using the system uh, it's, it's funny, um, you know, if, if something like that existed in business, it would be out of business tomorrow. So we need to go back and, yes, we have resources we can, you know, use for that if we stop playing, you know, corporatist and we stop sending money to Bill Gates and we stop, you know, creating bike trails and everything else. I mean, you know, the core job of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. And whenever it wanders out of that, it creates a real mess. Ms. Valentine. Thank you for the question. This is a really important issue um, when it comes to foster care. Um, West Virginia has the highest rate of uh, children in foster care in the country. We have over 6,000 children in foster care. Um, and we know that our children are facing ne uh, ne neglect and abuse. Um, and unfortunately, we have even have um, seen children uh, pass away from uh, circumstances while in, in foster care. And so we really need to raise um, wages for our CPS workers. We need to reform our CPS system so that we can c combat the staffing shortages that we're seeing. Um, because as of June, there was a backlog of over 400 cases, um, CPS um, investigations. And so that means that those children are not getting um, their situations investigated in a timely manner and that, you know, um, further increases abuse and neglect cases. And so we really need to make sure that we're increasing transparency when it comes to this issue. I know that um, DHS has now taken on foster care, and so we're really looking at ways that the state can um, continue to reform the system, and that absolutely has to be a number one priority so that we can protect our West Virginia children. Any follow-ups there, Bill? I don't think so. Thank uh, you. Chris, I want to ask you a question in regards to uh, we don't need to be building bike trails. Is that something specific about bike trails, or, or are you saying that government shouldn't be funding parks and recreation? No, what I'm saying is when we had the budget surplus recently, they said it was a budget surplus and that money is supposed to go back to the taxpayers. It's their money to start off with because government does not have any money. It does not take from the people, right? And then politicians use that money to go around the state to put in everything from bike trails to little league fields, basically buying votes for their next election cycle because they can show up when it's all you know, when it's all put in and say, look, I did this, vote for me next time. Okay, what I'm saying is when we're done with the budget and when we're done with everything else, any funds left over should go back to the people because I believe in the people. The people, you know, have to have the economic ability in this horrible economy with this insane inflation that we're all facing right now where the democratic policies of print money and spend it, print money and spend it, print money and spend it has created the inflation that people cannot afford food they can't afford housing i mean i know my uh, my i recently received a bill from a homeowner's insurance and it doubled right everything is going up because government just keeps spending other people's money we need to get the money back to the people so they can afford to live it's time to move on to closing statements uh, we started with lucia at the uh, beginning of closing statements so chris will begin uh, start with opening statements so chris will begin with you with the closing statement Okay. Try to keep this to a minute or so. Again, I'm Chris Anders. I'm the Republican nominee for the 97th House of Delegate seat. 250 years ago, farmers, shopkeepers, students, fathers and sons fought against the world's most powerful army in the American Revolution. They did so because of government gun confiscation, a 2% tax on tea, the cronyism and corruption with the British government, as well as the destruction of due process of law. Fast forward to today, we're facing many of these same problems under our own government. The Founding Fathers would be ashamed. 
So what if we could do something about it? What if we could change this? And that is my goal, is to restore your freedom, your liberty that so many die for, because we owe it to them for all they sacrificed. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children. But most importantly, we owe it to our God who gave us these rights to begin with. Thank you so much, and God bless. Lucia Valentine. Thank you. I want to thank you again for your time this morning and hosting this forum to allow the voters to learn more about um, what's happening at the local level in District 97 and why it's so important to get out and vote this year in District 97. Um, I fundamentally believe, and this is probably where I differ the most from my opponent, I fundamentally believe that our government can work for us when we elect the right leaders. And District 97 deserves a leader who understands that our state is facing serious local issues that require serious solutions and serious leadership to actually get things done. Um, and I know how to push past divisive partisan politics that are counterproductive to delivering results for the people, and I intend to do that when elected. Again, I have experience working at the Capitol, passing legislation in a bipartisan way, and I will apply my skills to this job. Um, because I know that I'm elected to represent everyone in my district, not just those of my party, not just those who voted for me. And so I'm committed to finding common ground in places where we can all agree, because that is how we move our state forward, that is how we uphold our shared West Virginia values, and that is how we work together to create the future that we deserve here in West Virginia. So thank you all for your time. Early voting starts tomorrow, Octo October 23rd, and runs through November 2nd. Um, and election day is, of course, on November 5th. I ask for your vote um, during early voting and on election day, you can visit my website, valentineforwv.com, and I have all of the early voting locations and times available for folks. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And thank you again for this discussion. Thank you both for attending, and we wish you both the best of luck on election day. Thank you very much. And we are back with more in two minutes.